Act Two of Candida by George Bernard Shaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The same day, the same room, late in the afternoon. The spare chair for visitors has been replaced at the table, which is, if possible, more untidy than before. Marchbanks, alone and idle, is trying to find out how the typewriter works. Hearing someone at the door, he steals guiltily away to the window and pretends to be absorbed in the view. Miss Garnet, carrying the notebook in which she takes down Morell's letters in shorthand from his dictation, sits down at the typewriter and sets to work transcribing them, much too busy to notice Eugene. Unfortunately, the first key she strikes sticks. Prospering. Bother. You've been meddling with my typewriter, Mr. Marchbanks, and there's not the least use in your trying to look as if you hadn't. Marchbanks, timidly. I'm very sorry, Miss Garnet. I only tried to make it right. Prosperine. Well, you've made this key stick. Marchbanks, earnestly. I assure you I didn't touch the keys. I didn't indeed. I only turned a little wheel. He points irresolutely at the tension wheel. Prosperine. Oh, now I understand. She sets the machine to rights, talking volubly all the time. I suppose you thought it was a sort of barrel organ. Nothing to do but turn the handle, and it would write a beautiful love letter for you straight off, eh? Marchbanks, seriously. I suppose a machine could be made to write love letters. They're all the same, aren't they? Prosperine, somewhat indignantly, any such discussion except by way of pleasantry being outside her code of manners. How do I know? Why do you ask me? Marchbanks, I beg your pardon. I thought clever people, people who can do business and write letters and that sort of thing, always had love affairs. Prosperine, rising, outraged. Mr. Marchbanks! She looks severely at him and marches with much dignity to the bookcase. Marchbanks, approaching her humbly. I hope I haven't offended you. Perhaps I shouldn't have alluded to your love affairs. Prosperine, plucking a blue book from the shelf and turning sharply on him. I haven't any love affairs. How dare you say such a thing? Marchbanks, simply. Really? Oh, then you are shy, like me. Isn't that so? Prosperine. Certainly I am not shy. What do you mean? Marchbanks, secretly. You must be. That is the reason there are so few love affairs in the world. We all go about longing for love. It is the first need of our natures, the loudest cry of our hearts. But we dare not utter our longing. We are too shy. Very earnestly. Oh, Miss Garnet, what would you not give to be without fear, without shame? Prosperine, scandalized. Well, upon my word. Marchbanks, with petulant impatience. Ah, don't say those stupid things to me. They don't deceive me. What use are they? Why are you afraid to be your real self with me? I am just like you. Prosperine. Like me? Pray, are you flattering me or flattering yourself? I don't feel quite sure which. She turns to go back to the typewriter. Marchbanks, stopping her mysteriously. Hush! I go about in search of love, and I find it in unmeasured stores in the bosoms of others. But when I try to ask for it, this horrible shyness strangles me, and I stand dumb, or worse than dumb, saying meaningless things, foolish lies. And I see the affection I am longing for, given to dogs and cats and pet birds, because they come and ask for it. Almost whispering, It must be asked for. It is like a ghost. It cannot speak unless it is first spoken to. 
at his normal pitch but with deep melancholy all the love in the world is longing to speak only it dare not because it is shy 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 that is the world's tragedy with a deep sigh he sits in the spare chair and buries his face in his hands prosperine amazed but keeping her wits about her her point of honor in encounters with strange young men wicked people get over that shyness occasionally don't they marchbanks scrambling up almost fiercely wicked people means people who have no love therefore they have no shame they have the power to ask love because they don't need it they have the power to offer it because they have none to give he collapses into his seat and adds mournfully but we who have love and long to mingle it with the love of others we cannot utter a word timidly you find that don't you prosperine look here if you don't stop talking like this i'll leave the room mr marchbanks i really will it's not proper she resumes her seat at the typewriter opening the blue book and preparing to copy a passage from it marchbanks hopelessly nothing that's worth saying is proper he rises and wanders about the room in his lost way saying i can't understand you miss garnet what am i to talk about prosperine snubbing him talk about indifferent things talk about the weather marchbanks would you stand and talk about indifferent things if a child were by crying bitterly with hunger prosperine i suppose not marchbanks well i can't talk about indifferent things with my heart crying out bitterly in its hunger prosperine then hold your tongue marchbanks yes that is what it always comes to we hold our tongues does that stop the cry of your heart for it does cry doesn't it it must if you have a heart prosperine suddenly rising with her hand pressed on her heart oh it's no use trying to work while you talk like that she leaves her little table and sits on the sofa her feelings are evidently strongly worked on it's no business of yours whether my heart cries or not but i have a mind to tell you for all that marchbanks you needn't i know already that it must prosperine but mind if you ever say i said so i'll deny it marchbanks compassionately yes i know and so you haven't the courage to tell him prosperine bouncing up him who marchbanks whoever he is the man you love it might be anybody the curate mr mill perhaps prosperine with disdain mr mill a fine man to break my heart about indeed <laughs> i'd rather have you than mr mill marchbanks recoiling no really i'm very sorry but you mustn't think of that i prosperine testily crossing to the fire and standing at it with her back to him oh don't be frightened it's not you it's not any one particular person marchbanks i know you feel that you could love anybody that offered prosperine exasperated anybody that offered no i do not what do you take me for marchbanks discouraged no use you won't make me real answers only those things that everybody says he strays to the sofa and sits down disconsolately prosperine nettled at what she takes to be a disparagement of her manners by an aristocrat oh well if you want original conversation you'd better go and talk to yourself marchbanks that is what all poets do they talk to themselves out loud and the world overhears them 
but it's horribly lonely not to hear someone else talk sometimes prosperine wait until mr morell comes he'll talk to you marchbank shudders oh you needn't make wry faces over him he can talk better than you with temper he'd talk your little head off she is going back angrily to her place when suddenly enlightened he springs up and stops her marchbanks ah i understand now prosperine reddening what do you understand marchbanks your secret tell me is it really and truly possible for a woman to love him prosperine as if this were beyond all bounds well marchbanks passionately no answer me i want to know i must know i can't understand it i can see nothing in him but words pious resolutions what people call goodness you can't love that prosperine attempting to snub him by an air of cool propriety i simply don't know what you're talking about i don't understand you marchbanks vehemently you do you lie prosperine oh marchbanks you do understand and you know determined to have an answer is it possible for a woman to love him prosperine looking him straight in the face yes he covers his face with his hands whatever is the matter with you he takes down his hands and looks at her frightened at the tragic mask presented to her she hurries past him at the utmost possible distance keeping her eyes on his face until he turns from her and goes to the child's chair beside the hearth where he sits in the deepest dejection as she approaches the door it opens and burgess enters on seeing him she ejaculates praise heaven here's somebody and sits down reassured at her table she puts a fresh sheet of paper into the typewriter as burgess crosses to eugene burgess bent on taking care of the distinguished visitor well so this is the way they leave you to yourself mr marchbanks i've come to keep you company marchbanks looks up at him in consternation which is quite lost on him james is receiving a deputation in the dining room and candy is upstairs educating of a young stitcher girl she's interested in she's settin there learning her to read out of the evelyn twins condolingly you must find it lonesome here with no one but the typist to talk to he pulls round the easy chair above fire and sits down prosperine highly incensed he'll be all right now that he has the advantage of your polished conversation that's one comfort anyhow she begins to typewrite with clattering asperity burgess amazed at her audacity i was not addressing myself to you young woman that i'm aware of prosperine tartly to marchbanks did you ever see worse manners mr marchbanks burgess with pompous severity mr marchbanks is a gentleman and knows his place which is more than some people do prosperine fretfully it's well you and i are not ladies and gentlemen i'd talk to you pretty straight if mr marchbanks wasn't here she pulls the letter out of the machine so crossly that it tears there now i've spoiled this letter have to be done all over again oh i can't contain myself silly old fathead burgess rising breathless with indignation oh i'm a silly old fathead am i oh indeed G gasping all right my girl all right you just wait till i tell that to your employer you'll see i'll teach you see if i don't prosperine i 
Burgess, cutting her short. No, you've done it now. <laughs> no use a talking to me. <laughs> I'll let you know who I am. Prosperine shifts her paper carriage with a defiant bang and disdainfully goes on with her work. Don't you take no notice of her, Mr. Mortsbanks. She's beneath it. He sits down again, loftily. Marchbanks, miserably nervous and disconcerted. Hadn't we better change the subject? I, I, I don't think Miss Garnet meant anything. Prosperine, with intense convictions. Oh, didn't I, though, just? Burgess, I won't demean myself to take notice of her. An electric bell rings twice. Prosperine, gathering up her notebook and papers. That's for me. She hurries out. Burgess, calling after her. Oh, we can spare you. Somewhat relieved by the triumph of having the last word, and yet half inclined to try to improve on it, he looks after her for a moment, then subsides into his seat by Eugene, and addresses him very confidentially. Now we're alone, Mr. Marchbanks. Let me give you a friendly int that I wouldn't give to everybody. How long have you known my son-in-law James here? Marchbanks. I don't know. I never can remember dates. A few months, perhaps. Burgess. Ever notice anything queer about him? Marchbanks. I don't think so. Burgess, impressively. No more you wouldn't. That's the danger in it. Well, he's mad. Marchbanks. Mad? Burgess, mad as a March air. You take notice on him and you'll see. Marchbanks, beginning. But surely that is only because his opinions. Burgess, touching him with his forefinger on his knee and pressing it as if to hold his attention with it. That's what I used to think, Mr. Marchbanks. I thought long enough that it was only his opinions though my new opinions become very serious things when people takes to hacking on him as he does. But that's not what I go on. He looks round to make sure that they are alone, and bends over to Eugene's ear. What do you think he says to me this morning in this very room? Marchbanks. What? Burgess. He says to me... This is as sure as we're sitting here now, he says. I'm a fool, he says, and you're a scoundrel, as cool as possible. Me a scoundrel, mind you, <laughs> and then shook hands with me on it as if it was to my credit. Do you mean to tell me that that man's sane? Morel, outside, calling to Prosperine, holding the door open. Get all their names and addresses, Miss Garnet. Prosperine in the distance. Yes, Mr. Morell. Morell comes in with the deputation's documents in his hands. Burgess, aside to Marchbanks, your he is. Just you keep your eye on him and see. Rising momentously, I'm sorry, dames, to have to make a complaint to you. I don't want to do it, but I feel I arter as a matter of right and duty. Morell, what's the matter? Burgess. Mr. Marchbanks will bear me out. He was a witness. Very solemnly. Your young woman so far forgot herself as to call me a silly old fat Ed. Morell, delighted with tremendous heartiness. Oh, now, isn't that exactly like Prossy? She's so frank, she can't contain herself. Poor Prossy. Ha, ha, ha. Burgess, trembling with rage. And do you expect me to put up with it from the like of er? Morel. Posh nonsense. You can't take any notice of it. Never mind. He goes to the cellarette and puts the papers into one of the drawers. Burgess. Oh, I don't mind. I'm above it. But is it right? That's what I want to know. Is it right? Morel, that's a question for the church, not for the laity. Has it done you any harm? That's the question for you, eh? 
Of course it hasn't. Think no more of it. He dismisses the subject by going to his place at the table and setting to work at his correspondence. Burgess, aside to Marchbanks, What did I tell you? Mad as a adder? He goes to the table and asks, with the sickly civility of a hungry man, When's dinner, James? Morell, not for half an hour yet. Burgess, with plaintive resignation. Give me a nice book to read over the fire, will you, James? There's a good chap. Morell, what sort of book? A good one? Burgess, with almost a yell of remonstrance. No, somewhat pleasant, just to pass the time. Morell takes an illustrated paper from the table and offers it. He accepts it humbly. Thank you, James. He goes back to his easy chair at the fire and sits there at his ease, reading. Morell, as he writes, Candida will come to entertain you presently. She has got rid of her pupil. She is filling the lamps. Marchbanks, starting up in the wildest consternation. But that will soil her hands. I can't bear that, Morell. It's a shame. I'll go and fill them. He makes for the door. Morell, you'd better not. Marchbanks stops irresolutely. She'd only set you to clean my boots to save me the trouble of doing it myself in the morning. Burgess, with grave disapproval. Don't you keep a servant now, James? Morell, yes, but she isn't a slave, and the house looks as if I kept three. That means that everyone has to lend a hand. It's not a bad plan. Prossy and I can talk business after breakfast whilst we're washing up. Washing up's no trouble when there are two people to do it. Marchbanks, tormentedly, do you think every woman is as coarse-grained as Miss Garnet? Burgess, emphatically, that's quite right, Mr. Marchbanks, that's quite right, she is coarse-grained. Morell, quietly and significantly, Marchbanks. Marchbanks, yes. Morell, how many servants does your father keep? Marchbanks, oh, I don't know. He comes back uneasily to the sofa, as if to get as far as possible from Morell's questioning, and sits down in great agony of mind, thinking of the paraffin. Morell very gravely. So many that you don't know. More aggressively. Anyhow, when there's anything coarse-grained to be done, you ring the bell and throw it on to somebody else, eh? That's one of the great facts in your existence, isn't it? Marchbanks. Oh, don't torture me. The one great fact now is that your wife's beautiful fingers are dabbling in paraffin oil, and that you are sitting here comfortably preaching about it. Everlasting preaching, preaching, words, words, words. Burgess, intensely appreciating this retort. Ha, ha, devil a better, radiantly. Add you there, James, straight. Candida comes in, well-aproned, with a reading lamp trimmed, filled, and ready for lighting. She places it on the table near Morel, ready for use. Candida, brushing her fingertips together with a slight twitch of her nose. If you stay with us, Eugene, I think I will hand over the lamps to you. Marchbanks. I will stay on condition that you hand over all the rough work to me. Candida. That's very gallant, but I think I should like to see how you do it first. Turning to Morel. James, you've not been looking after the house properly. Morel. What have I done, or not done, my love? Candida, with serious vexation. My own particular pet scrubbing brush has been used for blackletting. A heartbreaking wail bursts from Marchbanks. Burgess looks round, amazed. Candida hurries to the sofa. What's the matter? Are you ill, Eugene? Marchbanks. No, not ill. Only horror, horror. Horror! He bows his head on his hands. Burgess, shocked. What? 
got the oars mr marchbanks oh that's bad at your age you must leave it off gradually candida reassured nonsense papa it's only poetic horror isn't it eugene petting him burgess abashed oh a poetic horror is it i beg your pardon i'm sure he turns to the fire again depreciating his hasty conclusion candida what is it eugene the scrubbing brush he shudders well there never mind she sits down beside him wouldn't you like to present me with a nice new one with an ivory back inlaid with mother-of-pearl marchbanks softly and musically but sadly and longingly no not a scrubbing brush but a boat a tiny shallop to sail away in far from the world where the marble floors are washed by the rain and dried by the sun where the south wind dusts the beautiful green and purple carpets or a chariot to carry us up into the sky where the lamps are stars and don't need to be filled with paraffin oil every day morel harshly and where there is nothing to do but to be idle selfish and useless candida jarred oh james how could you spoil it all marchbanks firing up yes to be idle selfish and useless that is to be beautiful and free and happy hasn't every man desired that with all his soul for the woman he loves that's my ideal what's yours and that of all the dreadful people who live in these hideous rows of houses sermons and scrubbing brushes with you to preach the sermon and your wife to scrub candida quaintly he cleans the boots eugene you will have to clean them tomorrow for saying that about him marchbanks oh don't talk about boots your feet should be beautiful on the mountains candida my feet would not be beautiful on the hackney road without boots burgess scandalized come candy don't be vulgar mr marchbanks ain't accustomed to it you're giving him the auras again i mean the poetic ones morel is silent apparently he is busy with his letters really he is puzzling with misgiving over his new and alarming experience that the surer he is of his moral thrusts the more swiftly and effectively eugene parries them to find himself beginning to fear a man whom he does not respect affects him bitterly miss garnet comes in with a telegram prosperine handing the telegram to morel reply paid the boys waiting to candida coming back to her machine and sitting down maria is ready for you now in the kitchen mrs morel candida rises the onions have come marchbanks convulsively onions candida yes onions not even spanish ones nasty little red onions you shall help me to slice them come along she catches him by the wrist and runs out pulling him after her burgess rises in consternation and stands aghast on the hearthrug staring after them burgess candy didn't order andal appears nervy like that it's going too fur with it look here james do we often get taken queer like that morel shortly writing a telegram i don't know burgess sentimentally he talks very pretty i always had a turn for a bit of poetry candy takes out of me that away used to make me tell her fairy stories when she was only a little kitty not that i indicating a stature of two feet or thereabouts morel preoccupied ah indeed he blots the telegram and goes out prosperine used you to make the fairy stories up out of your own head burgess not deigning to reply strikes an attitude of the haughtiest disdain on the hearthrug prosperine calmly i should never have supposed you had it in you 
By the way, I'd better warn you since you've taken such a fancy to Mr. Marchbanks. He's mad. Burgess. Mad? What? M2? Prospering. Mad as a March hare. He did frighten me, I can tell you, just before you came in that time. Haven't you noticed the queer things he says? Burgess. So that's what the poetic auras means. Blame me if it didn't come into my head once or twice that he must be off his jump. He crosses the room to the door, lifting up his voice as he goes. Well, this is a pretty sort of asylum for a man to be in, with no one but you to take care of him. Prosperine, as he passes her. Yes, what a dreadful thing it would be if anything happened to you. Burgess loftily. Don't you address no remarks to me. Tell your employer that I've gone into the garden for a smoke. Prosperine, mocking. Oh! Before Burgess can retort, Morell comes back. Burgess, sentimentally. Going for a turn in the garden to smoke, James. Morell, brusquely. Oh, all right, all right. Burgess goes out pathetically in the character of the weary old man. Morell stands at the table, turning over his papers and adding, across to Prosperine, half humorously, half absently, Well, Miss Prossy, why have you been calling my father-in-law names? Prosperine, blushing fiery red and looking quickly up at him, half scared, half reproachful, I... She bursts into tears. Morel, with tender gaiety, leaning across the table towards her and consoling her. Oh, come, come, come. Never mind, Pross. He is a silly old fathead, isn't he? With an explosive sob, she makes a dash to the door and vanishes, banging it. Morel, shaking his head resignedly, sighs and goes wearily to his chair, where he sits down and sets to work, looking old and careworn. Candida comes in. She has finished her household work and taken off the apron. She at once notices his dejected appearance and posts herself quietly at the spare chair, looking down at him attentively, but she says nothing. Morel, looking up, but with his pen raised, ready to resume his work. Well, where is Eugene? Candida washing his hands in the scullery under the tap he will make an excellent cook if he can only get over his dread of maria morel shortly ha ah, no doubt he begins writing again candida going nearer and putting her hand down softly on his to stop him as she says come here dear let me look at you he drops his pen and yields himself at her disposal she makes him rise, and brings him a little way from the table, looking at him critically all the time. Turn your face to the light. She places him facing the window. My boy is not looking well. Has he been overworking? Morel, nothing more than usual. Candida, he looks very pale and gray and wrinkled and old. His melancholy deepens and she attacks it with willful gaiety. Here, pulling him towards the easy chair, you've done enough writing for today. Leave Prossy to finish it and come and talk with me. Morel. But, Candida, yes, I must be talked to sometimes. She makes him sit down and seats herself on the carpet beside his knee. Now, patting his hand, you're beginning to look better already. Why don't you give up all this tiresome overworking, going out every night lecturing and talking? Of course, what you say is all very true and very right, but it does no good. They don't mind what you say to them one little bit. Of course they agree with you, but what's the use of people agreeing with you if they go and do just the opposite of what you tell them the moment your back is turned? Look at our congregation at St. Dominic's. Why do they come to hear you talking about Christianity every Sunday? 
why just because they've been so full of business and money-making for six days that they want to forget all about it and have a rest on the seventh so that they can go back fresh and make money harder than ever you positively help them at it instead of hindering them morel with energetic seriousness you know very well candida that i often blow them up soundly for that but if there is nothing in their church going but rest and diversion why don't they try something more amusing more self-indulgent there must be some good in the fact that they prefer st dominic's to worst places on sundays candida oh the worst places aren't open and even if they were they daren't be seen going to them besides james dear you preach so splendidly that it's as good as a play for them why do you think the women are so enthusiastic morel shocked candida candida oh i know you silly boy you think it's your socialism and your religion but if it was that they'd do what you tell them instead of only coming to look at you they all have prossy's complaint morel prossy's complaint what do you mean candida candida yes prossy and all the other secretaries you've ever had why does prossy condescend to wash up the things and to peel potatoes and to base herself in all manner of ways for six shillings a week less than she used to get in the city office she's in love with you james that's the reason they're all in love with you and you are in love with preaching because you do it so beautifully and you think it's all enthusiasm for the kingdom of heaven on earth and so do they you dear silly morel candida what dreadful what soul-destroying cynicism are you jesting or can it be are you jealous candida with curious thoughtfulness yes i feel a little jealous sometimes morel incredulously what of prossy candida laughing no 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 not jealous of anybody jealous for somebody else who is not loved as he ought to be morel me candida you why you're spoiled with love and worship you get far more than is good for you no i mean eugene morel startled eugene candida it seems unfair that all the love should go to you and none to him although he needs it so much more than you do a convulsive movement shakes him in spite of himself what's the matter am i worrying you morel hastily not at all looking at her with troubled intensity you know that i have perfect confidence in you candida candida you vain thing are you so sure of your irresistible attractions morel candida you are shocking me i never thought of my attractions i thought of your goodness your purity that is what i confide in candida what a nasty uncomfortable thing to say to me oh you are a clergyman james a thorough clergyman morel turning away from her heart-stricken so eugene says candida with lively interest leaning over to him with her arms on his knee eugene's always right he's a wonderful boy i have grown fonder and fonder of him all the time i was away do you know james that though he has not the least suspicion of it himself he is ready to fall madly in love with me morel grimly oh he has no suspicion of it himself hasn't he candida not a bit she takes her arms from his knee and turns thoughtfully sinking into a more restful attitude with her hands in her lap some day he will know when he is grown up and experienced like you and he will know that i must have known i wonder what he will think of me then morel 
No evil, Candida. I hope and trust no evil. Candida, dubiously. That will depend. Morel, bewildered. Depend? Candida, looking at him. Yes, it will depend on what happens to him. He looks vacantly at her. Don't you see? It will depend on how he comes to learn what love really is. I mean, on the sort of woman who will teach it to him. Morel, quite at a loss. Yes. No. I don't know what you mean. Candida, explaining. If he learns it from a good woman, then it will be all right. He will forgive me. Morel, forgive? Candida, but suppose he learns it from a bad woman, as so many men do, especially poetic men, who imagine all women are angels. Suppose he only discovers the value of love when he has thrown it away and degraded himself in his ignorance. Will he forgive me then, do you think? Morel, forgive you for what? Candida, realizing how stupid he is and a little disappointed, though quite tenderly so. Don't you understand? He shakes his head. She turns to him again, so as to explain with the fondest intimacy. I mean, will he forgive me for not teaching him myself, for abandoning him to the bad women for the sake of my goodness, my purity, as you call it? Ah, oh, James, how little you understand me to talk of your confidence in my goodness and purity. I would give them both to poor Eugene as willingly as I would give my shawl to a beggar dying of cold, if there were nothing else to restrain me. Put your trust in my love for you, James, for if that went, I should care very little for your sermons, mere phrases that you cheat yourself and others with every day. She is about to rise. Morel. His words. Candida, checking herself quickly in the act of getting up, so that she is on her knees but upright. Whose words? Morel. Eugene's. Candida, delighted. He is always right. He understands you. He understands me. He understands Prossy. And you, James, you understand nothing. She laughs and kisses him to console him. He recoils as if stung and springs up. Morel. How can you bear to do that when— Oh, Candida, with anguish in his voice— I had rather you had plunged a grappling iron into my heart than give me that kiss. Candida, rising, alarmed. My dear, what's the matter? Morel, frantically waving her off. Don't touch me. Candida, amazed. James! They are interrupted by the entrance of Marchbanks with Burgess, who stops near the door staring, whilst Eugene hurries forward between them. Marchbanks. Is anything the matter? Morel, deadly white, putting an iron constraint on himself. Nothing but this, that either you were right this morning, or Candida is mad. Burgess, in loudest protest. What? Candy mad too? Oh, come, come, come. He crosses the room to the fireplace, protesting as he goes, and knocks the ashes out of his pipe on the bars. Morel sits down desperately, leaning forward to hide his face, and interlacing his fingers rigidly to keep them steady. Candida, to Morel, relieved and laughing. Oh, you're only shocked, is that all? How conventional all you unconventional people are. Burgess. Come, behave yourself, Candy. What'll Mr. Morchbanks think of you? Candida. This comes of James teaching me to think for myself, and never to hold back out of fear of what other people may think of me. It works beautifully, as long as I think the same things as he does. But now, because I have just thought something different, look at him, just look. She points to Morel, greatly amused. Eugene looks and instantly presses his hand on his heart as if some deadly pain had shot through it, and sits down on the sofa like a man witnessing a tragedy. Burgess, 
on the hearth rug. Well, James, you certainly ain't as impressive looking as usual. Morel with a laugh which is half a sob. I suppose not. I beg your pardons. I was not conscious of making a fuss. Pulling himself together. Well, 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 well. He goes back to his place at the table, setting to work at his papers again with resolute cheerfulness. Candida, going to the sofa and sitting beside Marchbanks, still in a bantering humor. Well, Eugene, why are you so sad? Did the onions make you cry? Morel cannot prevent himself from watching them. Marchbanks, aside to her, It is your cruelty. I hate cruelty. It is a horrible thing to see one person make another suffer. Candida, petting him ironically, Poor boy, have I been cruel? Did I make you slice nasty little red onions? Marchbanks earnestly. Oh, stop, stop. I didn't mean myself. You have made him suffer frightfully. I feel his pain in my own heart. I know that it is not your fault. It is something that must happen. But don't make light of it. I shudder when you torture him and laugh. Candida incredulously i tortured james nonsense eugene how you exaggerate silly she looks round at morel who hastily resumes his writing she goes to him and stands behind his chair bending over him don't work any more dear come and talk to us morel affectionately but bitterly ah no i can't talk i can only preach Candida caressing him. Well, come and preach. Burgess strongly remonstrating. Ah, no, Candy, hang it all. Lexi Mill comes in, looking anxious and important. Lexi, hastening to shake hands with Candida. How do you do, Mrs. Morell? So glad to see you back again. Candida, thank you, Lexi. You know Eugene, don't you? Lexi, oh, yes. How do you do, Marchbanks? Marchbanks, quite well, thanks. Lexi to Morel. I've just come from the Guild of St. Matthew. They are in the greatest consternation about your telegram. There's nothing wrong, is there? Candida. What did you telegraph about, James? Lexi to Candida. He was to have spoken for them tonight. They've taken the large hall in Mare Street and spent a lot of money on posters. Morel's telegram was to say he couldn't come. It came on them like a thunderbolt. Candida, surprised and beginning to suspect something wrong. Given up an engagement to speak? Burgess. First time in his life, I'll bet, ain't it, Candy? Lexi to Morel. They decided to send an urgent telegram to you, asking whether you could not change your mind. Have you received it? Morel with restrained impatience. Yes, yes, I got it. Lexi, it was reply paid. Morel, yes, I know. I answered it. I can't go. Candida, but why, James? Morel, almost fiercely, because I don't choose. These people forget that I am a man. They think I am a talking machine to be turned on for their pleasure every evening of my life. May I not have one night at home with my wife and my friends? They are all amazed at this outburst, except Eugene. His expression remains unchanged. Candida. Oh, James, you know you'll have an attack of bad conscience tomorrow, and I shall have to suffer for that. Lexi, intimidated but urgent. I know, of course, that they make the most unreasonable demands on you. But they have been telegraphing all over the place for another speaker, and they can get nobody but the president of the Agnostic League. Morel, promptly. Well, an excellent man. What better do they want? Lexi. But he always insists so powerfully on the divorce of socialism from Christianity. He will undo all the good we have been doing. Of course, you know best, but he hesitates. Candida, coaxingly. Oh, do go, James. 
We'll all go. Burgess, grumbling. Look here, Candy, I say, uh, let's stay at home by the fire, comfortable. He won't need to be more than a couple of hour away. Candida, you'll be just as comfortable at the meeting. We'll all sit on the platform and be great people. Eugene, terrified. Oh, please don't let us go on the platform. No, uh, everyone will stare at us. I couldn't. I'll sit at the back of the room. Candida, don't be afraid. They'll be too busy looking at James to notice you. Morel, turning his head and looking meaningly at her over his shoulder. Prossy's complaint, Candida, eh? Candida, gaily. Yes. Burgess, mystified. Prossy's complaint? What are you talking about, James? Morel, not heeding him, rises, goes to the door, and holds it open, shouting in a commanding voice. Miss Garnet? Prosperine, in the distance. Yes, Mr. Morel, coming. They all wait, except Burgess, who goes stealthily to Lexi and draws him aside. Burgess. Listen here, Mr. Mill. What's Prossy's complaint? What's wrong with her? Lexi, confidentially. Well, I don't exactly know, but she spoke very strangely to me this morning. I'm afraid she's a little out of her mind sometimes. Burgess overwhelmed. Why, it must be catching. Four in the same house. He goes back to the hearth, quite lost before the instability of the human intellect in a clergyman's house. Prosperine, appearing on the threshold. What is it, Mr. Morell? Morell, telegraph to the Guild of St. Matthew that I am coming. Prosperine, surprised. Don't they expect you? Morell, peremptorily, do as I tell you. Prosperine, frightened, sits down at her typewriter and obeys. Morell goes across to Burgess, Candida watching his movements all the time with growing wonder and misgiving. Morell, Burgess, you don't want to come? Burgess, in deprecation, oh, don't put it like that, James. It's only that it ain't Sunday, you know. Morel, I'm sorry. I thought you might like to be introduced to the chairman. He's on the works committee of the county council and has some influence in the matter of contracts. Burgess wakes up at once. Morel, expecting as much, waits a moment and says, Will you come? Burgess, with enthusiasm. Course I'll come, James. Ain't it always a pleasure to ear you? Morell, turning from him. I shall want you to take some notes at the meeting, Miss Garnet, if you have no other engagement. She nods, afraid to speak. You are coming, Lexy, I suppose? Lexy, certainly. Candida, we are all coming, James. Morell. No, you are not coming, and Eugene is not coming. You will stay here and entertain him to celebrate your return home. Eugene rises, breathless. Candida, but James, Morel, authoritatively, I insist. You do not want to come, and he does not want to come. Candida is about to protest. Oh, don't concern yourselves. I shall have plenty of people without you. Your chairs will be wanted by unconverted people who have never heard me before. Candida, troubled. Eugene, wouldn't you like to come? Morel, I should be afraid to let myself go before Eugene. He is so critical of sermons. Looking at him, he knows I am afraid of him. He told me as much this morning. Well, I shall show him how much afraid I am by leaving him here in your custody, Candida. Marchbanks, to himself with vivid feeling. That's brave. That's beautiful. He sits down again, listening with parted lips. Candida, with anxious misgiving. But, but, is anything the matter, James? Greatly troubled. I can't understand. Morel. Ah, I thought it was I who couldn't understand, dear. He takes her tenderly in his arms and kisses her on the forehead, then looks round quietly at Marchbanks. 
End of Act Two. Act Three of Candida by George Bernard Shaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Act Three. Late in the evening, past ten. The curtains are drawn and the lamps lighted. The typewriter is in its case. The large table has been cleared and tidied. Everything indicates that the day's work is done. Candida and Marchbanks are seated at the fire. The reading lamp is on the mantel shelf above Marchbanks, who is sitting on the small chair reading aloud from a manuscript. A little pile of manuscripts and a couple of volumes of poetry are on the carpet beside him. Candida is in the easy chair with the poker, a light brass one, upright in her hand. She is leaning back and looking at the point of it curiously, with her feet stretched towards the blaze and her heels resting on the fender, profoundly unconscious of her appearance and surroundings. Marchbanks, breaking off in his recitation, every poet that ever lived has put that thought into a sonnet. He must, he can't help it. He looks to her for assent and notices her absorption in the poker. Haven't you been listening? No response. Mrs. Morell? Candida starting. Eh? Marchbanks. Haven't you been listening? Candida, with a guilty excess of politeness. Oh, yes, it's very nice. Go on, Eugene. I'm longing to hear what happens to the angel. Marchbanks, crushed, the manuscript dropping from his hand to the floor. I beg your pardon for boring you. Candida. But you are not boring me, I assure you. Please do go on, do, Eugene. Marchbanks. I finished the poem about the angel quarter of an hour ago. I've read you several things since. Candida remorsefully. I'm so sorry, Eugene. I think the poker must have fascinated me. She puts it down. Marchbanks. It made me horribly uneasy. Candida. Why didn't you tell me? I'd have put it down at once. Marchbanks. I was afraid of making you uneasy, too. It looked as if it were a weapon. If I were a hero of old, I should have laid my drawn sword between us. If Morel had come in, he would have thought you had taken up the poker because there was no sword between us. Candida, wondering. What? With a puzzled glance at him. I can't quite follow that. Those sonnets of yours have perfectly addled me. Why should there be a sword between us? Marchbanks, evasively. Oh, never mind. He stoops to pick up the manuscript. Candida, put that down again, Eugene. There are limits to my appetite for poetry, even your poetry. You've been reading to me for more than two hours, ever since James went out. I want to talk. Marchbanks, rising, scared. No, I mustn't talk. He looks round him in his lost way and adds suddenly, I think I'll go out and take a walk in the park, making for the door. Candida, nonsense. It's shut long ago. Come and sit down on the hearth rug and talk moonshine as you usually do. I want to be amused. Don't you want to? Marchbanks, in half terror, half rapture. Yes. Candida, then come along. She moves her chair back a little to make room. He hesitates, then timidly stretches himself on the hearth rug, face upward and throws back his head across her knees, looking up at her. Marchbanks. Oh, I've been so miserable all evening because I was doing right. Now I am doing wrong, and I'm happy. Candida, tenderly amused at him. Yes, I'm sure you feel a great grown-up wicked deceiver. Quite proud of yourself, aren't you? Marchbanks, raising his head quickly and turning a little to look round at her. 
take care i'm ever so much older than you if you only knew he turns quite over on his knees with his hands clasped and his arms on her lap and speaks with growing impulse his blood beginning to stir may i say some wicked things to you candida without the least fear or coldness quite nobly and with perfect respect for his passion but with a touch of her wise-hearted maternal humor no but you may say anything you really and truly feel anything at all no matter what it is i am not afraid so long as it is your real self that speaks and not a mere attitude a gallant attitude or a wicked attitude or even a poetic attitude i put you on your honor and truth now say whatever you want to marchbanks the eager expression vanishing utterly from his lips and nostrils as his eyes light up with pathetic spirituality oh now i can't say anything all the words i know belong to some attitude or other all except one candida which one is that marchbanks softly losing himself in the music of the name candida 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 i must say that now because you have put me on my honor and truth and i never think or feel mrs morell it is always candida candida of course and what have you to say to candida marchbanks nothing but to repeat your name a thousand times don't you feel that every time is a prayer to you candida doesn't it make you happy to be able to pray marchbanks yes very happy candida well that happiness is the answer to your prayer do you want anything more marchbanks in beatitude no i have come into heaven where want is unknown morell comes in he halts on the threshold and takes in the scene at a glance morell grave and self-contained i hope i don't disturb you candida starts up violently but without the smallest embarrassment laughing at herself eugene still kneeling saves himself from falling by putting his hands on the seat of the chair and remains there staring open-mouthed at morell candida as she rises oh james how you startled me i was so taken up with eugene that i didn't hear your latchkey how did the meeting go off did you speak well morell i have never spoken better in my life candida that was first-rate how much was the collection morell i forgot to ask candida to eugene he must have spoken splendidly or he would never have forgotten that to morell where are all the others morell they left long before i could get away i thought i should never escape i believe they are having supper somewhere candida in her domestic business tone oh in that case maria may go to bed i'll tell her she goes out to the kitchen morell looking sternly down at marchbanks well marchbanks squatting cross-legged on the hearth-rug and actually at ease with morell even impishly humorous well morell have you anything to tell me marchbanks only that i have been making a fool of myself here in private whilst you have been making a fool of yourself in public morell hardly in the same way i think marchbanks scrambling up eagerly the very 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 same way i have been playing the good man just like you when you began your heroics about leaving me here with candida morell involuntarily candida marchbanks oh yes i've got that far 
heroics are infectious i caught the disease from you i swore not to say a word in your absence that i would not have said a month ago in your presence morell did you keep your oath marchbanks suddenly perching himself grotesquely on the easy chair i was ass enough to keep it until about ten minutes ago up to that moment i went on desperately reading to her reading my own poems anybody's poems to stave off a conversation i was standing outside the gate of heaven and refusing to go in oh you can't think how heroic it was and how uncomfortable then morell steadily controlling his suspense then marchbanks prosaically slipping down into a quite ordinary attitude in the chair then she couldn't bear being read to any longer morell and you approached the gate of heaven at last marchbanks yes morell well fiercely speak man have you no feeling for me marchbanks softly and musically then she became an angel and there was a flaming sword that turned every way so that i couldn't go in for i saw that that gate was really the gate of hell morell triumphantly she repulsed you marchbanks rising in wild scorn no you fool if she had done that i should never have seen that i was in heaven already repulsed me you think that would have saved me virtuous indignation oh you are not worthy to live in the same world with her he turns away contemptuously to the other side of the room morell who has watched him quietly without changing his place do you think you make yourself more worthy by reviling me eugene marchbanks here endeth the thousand and first lesson morell i don't think much of your preaching after all i believe i could do it better myself the man i want to meet is the man that candida married morell the man that do you mean me marchbanks i don't mean the reverend james maver morell moralist and windbag i mean the real man that the reverend james must have hidden somewhere inside his black coat the man that candida loved you can't make a woman like candida love you by merely buttoning your collar at the back instead of in front morell boldly and steadily when candida promised to marry me i was the same moralist and windbag that you now see i wore my black coat and my collar was buttoned behind instead of in front do you think she would have loved me any better for being insincere in my profession marchbanks on the sofa hugging his ankles oh she forgave you just as she forgives me for being a coward and a weakling and what you call a sniveling little whelp and all the rest of it dreamily a woman like that has divine insight she loves our souls and not our follies and vanities and illusions or our collars and coats or any other of the rags and tatters we are rolled up in he reflects on this for an instant then turns intently to question morell what i want to know is how you got past the flaming sword that stopped me morell meaningly perhaps because i was not interrupted at the end of ten minutes marchbanks taken aback what morell men can climb to the highest summits but he cannot dwell there long marchbanks it's false there can he dwell forever and there only it's in the other moments that he can find no rest no sense of the silent glory of life where would you have me spend my moments if not on the summits morell in the scullery slicing onions and filling lamps marchbanks 
or in the pulpit scrubbing clean earthenware soles morel yes that too it was there that i earned my golden moment and the right at that moment to ask her to love me i did not take the moment on credit nor did i use it to steal another man's happiness marchbanks rather disgustedly trotting back towards the fireplace i have no doubt you conducted the transaction as honestly as if you were buying a pound of cheese he stops on the brink of the hearthrug and adds thoughtfully to himself with his back turned to morel i could only go to her as a beggar morel starting a beggar dying of cold asking for her shawl marchbanks turning surprised thank you for touching up my poetry yes if you like a beggar dying of cold asking for her shawl morel excitedly and she refused shall i tell you why she refused i can tell you on her own authority it was because of marchbanks she didn't refuse morel not marchbanks she offered me all i chose to ask for her shawl her wings the warmth of stars on her head the lilies in her hand the crescent moon beneath her feet morel seizing him out with the truth man my wife is my wife i want no more of your poetic fripperies i know well that if i have lost her love and you have gained it no law will bind her marchbanks quaintly without fear or resistance catch me by the shirt collar morel she will arrange it for me afterwards as she did this morning with quiet rapture i shall feel her hands touch me morel you young imp do you know how dangerous it is to say that to me or with sudden misgiving has something made you brave marchbanks i'm not afraid now i disliked you before that was why i shrank from your touch but i saw today when she tortured you that you love her since then i have been your friend you may strangle me if you like morel releasing him eugene if that is not a heartless lie if you have a spark of human feeling left in you will you tell me what has happened during my absence marchbanks what happened why the flaming sword morel stamps with impatience well in plain prose i loved her so exquisitely that i wanted nothing more than the happiness of being in such love and before i had time to come down from the highest summits you came in morel suffering deeply so it is still unsettled still the misery of doubt marchbanks misery i am the happiest of men i desire nothing now but her happiness with dreamy enthusiasm oh morel let us both give her up why should she have to choose between a wretched little nervous disease like me and a pig-headed parson like you let us go on a pilgrimage you to the east and i to the west in search of a worthy lover for her some beautiful archangel with purple wings morel some fiddlestick oh if she is mad enough to leave me for you who will protect her who will help her who will work for her who will be a father to her children he sits down distractedly on the sofa with his elbows on his knees and his head propped on his clenched fists marchbanks snapping his fingers wildly she does not ask those silly questions it is she who wants somebody to protect to help to work for someone to give her children to protect to help and to work for some grown man who has become as a little child again oh you fool you fool you triple fool i am the man morel i am the man 
he danced about excitedly crying you don't understand what a woman is send for her morel send for her and let her choose between the door opens and candida enters he stops as if petrified candida amazed on the threshold what on earth are you at eugene marchbanks oddly james and i are having a preaching match and he is getting the worst of it candida looks quickly round at morel seeing that he is distressed she hurries down to him greatly vexed speaking with vigorous reproach to marchbanks candida you have been annoying him now i won't have it eugene do you hear putting her hand on morel's shoulder and quite forgetting her wifely tact in her annoyance my boy shall not be worried i will protect him morel rising proudly protect candida not heeding him to eugene what have you been saying marchbanks appalled nothing candida eugene nothing marchbanks piteously i mean i i'm very sorry i won't do it again indeed i won't i'll let him alone morel indignantly with an aggressive movement towards eugene let me alone you young candida stopping him Shh, no let me deal with him james marchbanks oh you're not angry with me are you candida severely yes i am very angry i have a great mind to pack you out of the house morel taken aback by candida's vigor and by no means relishing the sense of being rescued by her from another man gently candida gently i am able to take care of myself candida petting him yes dear of course you are but you mustn't be annoyed and made miserable marchbanks almost in tears turning to the door i'll go candida oh you needn't go i can't turn you out at this time of night vehemently shame on you for shame marchbanks desperately but what have i done candida i know what you have done as well as if i had been here all the time oh it was unworthy you are like a child you cannot hold your tongue marchbanks i would die ten times over sooner than give you a moment's pain candida with infinite contempt for this puerility much good your dying would do me morel candida my dear this altercation is hardly quite seemingly it is a matter between two men and i am the right person to settle it candida two men do you call that a man to eugene you bad boy marchbanks gathering a whimsically affectionate courage from the scolding if i am to be scolded like this i must make a boy's excuse he began it and he's bigger than i am candida losing confidence a little as her concern for morel's dignity takes the alarm that can't be true to morel you didn't begin it james did you morel contemptuously no marchbanks indignant oh morel to eugene you began it this morning candida instantly connecting this with his mysterious allusion in the afternoon to something told him by eugene in the morning looks quickly at him wrestling with the enigma morel proceeds with the emphasis of offended superiority but your other point is true i am certainly the bigger of the two and i hope the stronger candida so you had better leave the matter in my hands candida again soothing him yes dear but troubled i don't understand about this morning morel gently snubbing her you need not understand my dear candida but james i the street bell rings oh bother here they all come she goes out to let them in 
Marchbanks, running to Morel. Oh, Morel, isn't it dreadful? She's angry with us. She hates me. What shall I do? Morel, with quaint desperation, clutching himself by the hair. Eugene, my head is spinning round. I shall begin to laugh presently. He walks up and down the middle of the room. Marchbanks, following him anxiously. No, no, she'll think I've thrown you into hysterics. Don't laugh. Boisterous voices and laughter are heard approaching. Lexi Mill, his eyes sparkling and his bearing denoting unwanted elevation of spirit, enters with Burgess, who is greasy and self-complacent, but has all his wits about him. Miss Garnet, with her smartest hat and jacket on, follows them, but though her eyes are brighter than before, she is evidently a prey to misgiving. She places herself with her back to her typewriting table, with one hand on it to rest herself, passes the other across her forehead as if she were a little tired and giddy. Marchbanks relapses into shyness and edges away into the corner near the window where Morel's books are. Mill, exhilaratedly, Morel, I must congratulate you, grasping his hand. What a noble, splendid, inspired address you gave us. You surpassed yourself. Burgess, so you did, James. It fair kept me awake to the last word, didn't it, Miss Garnet? Prosperine, worriedly. Oh, I wasn't minding you. I was trying to make notes. She takes out her notebook and looks at her stenography, which nearly makes her cry. Morel, did I go too fast, Pros? Prosperine, much too fast. You know I can't do more than a hundred words a minute. She relieves her feelings by throwing her notebook angrily beside her machine, ready for use next morning. Morel, soothingly. Oh, well, well, never mind, never mind, never mind. Have you all had supper? Lexi, Mr. Burgess has been kind enough to give us a really splendid supper at the Belgrave. Burgess, with effusive magnanimity. Don't mention it, Mr. Mill. Modesty. You're already welcome to my little treat. Prosperine, we had champagne. I never tasted it before. I feel quite giddy. Morel, surprised. A champagne supper? That was very handsome. Was it my eloquence that produced all this extravagance? Mill, rhetorically, your eloquence and Mr. Burgess's goodness of heart. With a fresh burst of exhilaration, and what a very fine fellow the chairman is, Morel. He came to supper with us. Morel, with long-drawn significance, looking at Burgess. Oh, the chairman. Now I understand. Burgess, covering a lively satisfaction in his diplomatic cunning, with a depreciatory cough, retires to the hearth. Lexi folds his arms and leans against the cellaret in a high-spirited attitude. Candida comes in with glasses, lemons, and a jug of hot water on a tray. Candida. Who will have some lemonade? You know our rules. Total abstinence. She puts the tray on the table and takes up the lemon squeezers, looking inquiringly round at them. Morel. No use, dear. They've all had champagne. Bross has broken her pledge. Candida to Prosperine. You don't mean to say you've been drinking champagne? Prosperine, stubbornly. Yes, I do. I'm only a beer teetotaler, not a champagne teetotaler. I don't like beer. Are there any letters for me to answer, Mr. Morel? Morel, no more tonight. Prosperine, very well. Good night, everybody. Lexi, gallantly. Had I not better see you home, Miss Garnet? Prosperine, no, thank you. I shan't trust myself with anybody tonight. I wish I hadn't taken any of that stuff. She walks straight out. Burgess indignantly. Stuff indeed! That girl don't know what champagne is. Pomery and Greco at twelve and six a bottle. She took two glasses almost straight off. 
Morel a little anxious about her. Go and look after her, Lexy. Lexy, alarmed. But if she should really be, uh, suppose she begins to sing in the street or anything of that sort. Morel, just so, she may. That's why you'd better see her safely home. Candida, do, Lexy, there's a good fellow. She shakes his hand and pushes him gently to the door. Lexy, it's evidently my duty to go. I hope it may not be necessary. Good night, Mrs. Morell. To the rest, good night. He goes. Candida shuts the door. Burgess. He was gushing with extra piety himself, order two sips. People can't drink like they used to. Dismissing the subject and bustling away from the hearth. Well, James, it's time to lock up. Mr. Marchbanks, shall I have the pleasure of your company for a bit of the way home? Marchbanks, affrightedly. Yes, I'd better go. He hurries across to the door, but Candida places herself before it, barring his way. Candida, with quiet authority, you sit down. You're not going yet. Marchbanks, quailing. No, I, I, I didn't mean to. He comes back into the room and sits down abjectly on the sofa. Candida, Mr. Marchbanks will stay the night with us, Papa. Burgess, oh, well, I'll say good night. So long, James. He shakes hands with Morell and goes to Eugene. Make him give you a night light by your bed, Mr. Marchbanks. It'll comfort you if you wake up in the night with a touch of that complaint of yours. Good night. Marchbanks, thank you, I will. Good night, Mr. Burgess. They shake hands, and Burgess goes to the door. Candida, intercepting Morell, who is following Burgess. Stay here, dear. I'll put on Papa's coat for him. She goes out with Burgess. Marchbanks, Morell, there's going to be a terrible scene. Aren't you afraid? Morell, not in the least. Marchbanks, I never envied you your courage before. He rises timidly and puts his hand appealingly on Morel's forearm. Stand by me, won't you? Morel, casting him off gently but resolutely. Each for himself, Eugene. She must choose between us now. He goes to the other side of the room as Candida returns. Eugene sits down again on the sofa like a guilty schoolboy on his best behavior. Candida between them addressing eugene are you sorry marchbanks earnestly yes heartbroken candida well then you are forgiven now go off to bed like a good little boy i want to talk to james about you marchbanks rising in great consternation oh i can't do that morell i must be here i'll not go away tell her Candida, with quick suspicion. Tell me what? His eyes avoid hers furtively. She turns and mutely transfers the question to Morel. Morel, bracing himself for the catastrophe. I have nothing to tell her except, here his voice deepens to a measured and mournful tenderness, that she is my greatest treasure on earth, if she is really mine candida coldly offended by his yielding to his orator's instinct and treating her as if she were the audience at the guild of st matthew i am sure eugene can say no less if that is all marchbanks discouraged morell she's laughing at us morell with a quick touch of temper there's nothing to laugh at are you laughing at us, Candida? Candida, with quiet anger. Eugene is very quick-witted, James. I hope I am going to laugh, but I am not sure that I am not going to be very angry. She goes to the fireplace and stands there, leaning with her arm on the mantelpiece and her foot on the fender, whilst Eugene steals to Morel and plucks him by the sleeve. Marchbanks whispering 
Stop, Morel. Don't let us say anything. Morel, pushing Eugene away without deigning to look at him. I hope you don't mean that as a threat, Candida. Candida, with empathic warning. Take care, James. Eugene, I asked you to go. Are you going? Morel, putting his foot down. He shall not go. I wish him to remain. Marchbanks, I'll go. I'll do whatever you want. He turns to the door. Candida, stop. He obeys. Didn't you hear James say he wished you to stay? James is master here. Don't you know that? Marchbanks, flushing with a young poet's rage against tyranny. By what right is he master? Candida, quietly. Tell him, James. Morel, taken aback. My dear, I don't know of any right that makes me master. I assert no such right. Candida, with infinite reproach. You don't know? Oh, James, James. To Eugene, musingly. I wonder do you understand, Eugene? No, you're too young. Well, I'll give you leave to stay, to stay and learn. She comes away from the hearth and places herself between them. Now, James, what's the matter? Come, tell me. Marchbanks, whispering tremulously across to him, Don't! Candida, come, out with it. Morel, slowly. I meant to prepare your mind carefully, Candida, so as to prevent misunderstanding. Candida, yes, dear, I am sure you did. But never mind, I shan't misunderstand. Morel, well, er... Uh, he hesitates, unable to find the long explanation which he supposed to be available. Candida, well? Morel, baldly. Eugene declares that you are in love with him. Marchbanks, frantically. No, 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 never. I did not, Mrs. Morell. It's not true. I said I loved you and that he didn't. I said that I understood you and that he couldn't. And it was not after what passed there before the fire that I spoke. It was not on my word. It was this morning. Candida, enlightened. This morning. Marchbanks, yes. He looks at her, pleading for credence, and then adds simply, That was what was the matter with my collar. Candida, after a pause, for she does not take in his meaning at once. His collar? She turns to Morel, shocked. Oh, James, did you? She stops. Morel, ashamed. You know, Candida, that I have a temper to struggle with. And he said, shuddering, that you despised me in your heart. Candida, turning quickly to Eugene. Did you say that? Marchbanks, terrified. No! Candida, severely. Then James has just told me a falsehood. Is that what you mean? Marchbanks. No, no, I, I, I blurting out the explanation desperately. It was David's wife, and it wasn't at home. It was when she saw him dancing before all the people. Morel, taking the cue with a debater's adroitness. Dancing before all the people, Candida, and thinking he was moving their hearts by his mission when they were only suffering from Rossi's complaint. She is about to protest. He raises his hand to silence her, exclaiming, Don't try to look indignant, Candida. Candida interjecting. Try? Morel continuing. Eugene was right. As you told me a few hours after, he is always right. He said nothing that you did not say far better yourself. He is the poet who sees everything, and I am the poor parson who understands nothing. Candida, remorsefully, do you mind what is said by a foolish boy because I said something like it again in jest? Morel, 
that foolish boy can speak with the inspiration of a child and the cunning of a serpent he has claimed that you belong to him and not to me and rightly or wrongly i have come to fear that it may be true i will not go about tortured with doubts and suspicion i will not live with you and keep a secret from you i will not suffer the intolerable degradation of jealousy we have agreed he and i that you shall choose between us now i await your decision candida slowly recoiling a step her heart hardened by his rhetoric in spite of the sincere feeling behind it oh i am to choose am i i suppose it is quite settled that i must belong to one or the other morel firmly quite you must choose definitely marchbanks anxiously morel you don't understand she means that she belongs to herself candida turning on him i mean that and a good deal more master eugene as you will both find out presently and pray my lords and masters what have you to offer for my choice i am up for auction it seems what do you bid james morel reproachfully can he breaks down his eyes and throat fill with tears the orator becomes the wounded animal i can't speak candida impulsively going to him ah dearest marchbanks in wild alarm stop it's not fair you mustn't show her that you suffer morel i am on the rack too but i am not crying morel rallying all his forces <sighs> yes you are right it is not for pity that i am bidding he disengages himself from candida candida retreating chilled i beg your pardon james i did not mean to touch you i am waiting to hear your bid morel with proud humility i have nothing to offer you but my strength for your defence my honesty of purpose for your surety my ability and industry for your livelihood and my authority and position for your dignity that is all it becomes a man to offer to a woman candida quite quietly and you eugene what do you offer marchbanks my weakness my desolation my heart's need candida impressed that's a good bid eugene now i know how to make my choice she pauses and looks curiously from one to the other as if weighing them morel whose lofty confidence has changed into heartbreaking dread at eugene's bid loses all power of concealing his anxiety eugene strung to the highest tension does not move a muscle morel in a suffocated voice the appeal bursting from the depths of his anguish candida marchbanks aside in a flash of contempt coward candida significantly i give myself to the weaker of the two eugene divines her meaning at once his face whitens like steel in a furnace that cannot melt it morel bowing his head with the calm of collapse i accept your sentence candida candida do you understand eugene marchbanks oh i feel i'm lost he cannot bear the burden morel incredulously raising his head with prosaic abruptness do you mean me candida candida smiling a little let us sit and talk comfortably over it like three friends to morel sit down dear morel takes the chair from the fireplace the children's chair bring me that chair eugene she indicates the easy chair he fetches it silently even with something like cold strength and places it next to morel a little behind him she sits down he goes to the sofa and sits there 
still silent and inscrutable when they are all settled she begins throwing a spell of quietness on them by her calm sane tender tone you remember what you told me about yourself eugene how nobody has cared for you since your old nurse died how those clever fashionable sisters and successful brothers of yours were your mother's and father's pets how miserable you were at eton how your father is trying to starve you into returning to oxford how you have had to live without comfort or welcome or refuge always lonely and nearly always disliked and misunderstood poor boy marchbanks faithful to the nobility of his lot i had my books i had nature and at last i met you candida never mind that just at the present now i want you to look at this other boy here my boy spoiled from his cradle we go once a fortnight to see his parents you should come with us eugene and see the pictures of the hero of that household james as a baby the most wonderful of all babies james holding his first school prize one at the ripe age of eight james as the captain of his eleven james in his first frock coat james under all sorts of glorious circumstances you know how strong he is i hope he didn't hurt you how clever he is how happy with deepening gravity ask james's mother and his three sisters what it cost to save james the trouble of doing anything but be strong and clever and happy ask me what it costs to be james's mother and three sisters and wife and mother to his children all in one ask prossy and maria how troublesome the house is even when we have no visitors to help us to slice the onions ask the tradesmen who want to worry james and spoiled his beautiful sermons who it is that puts them off when there is money to give he gives it when there is money to refuse i refuse it i build a castle of comfort and indulgence and love for him and stand sentinel always to keep little vulgar cares out i make him master here though he does not know it and could not tell you a moment ago how it came to be so with sweet irony and when he thought i might go away with you his only anxiety was what should become of me of me and to tempt me to stay he offered me leaning forward to stroke his hair caressingly at each phrase his strength for my defence his industry for my livelihood his position for my dignity his relenting ah uh, i am mixing up your beautiful sentences and spoiling them am i not darling she lays her cheek fondly against his morel quite overcome kneeling beside his chair and embracing her with boyish ingenuousness it's all true every word what i am you have made me with the labor of your hands and the love of your heart you are my wife my mother my sisters you are the sum of all loving care to me candida in his arms smiling to eugene am i your mother and sisters to you eugene marchbanks rising with a fierce gesture of disgust ah oh, never out then into the night with me candida rising quickly and intercepting him you are not going like that eugene marchbanks with the ring of a man's voice no longer a boy's in the words i know the hour when it strikes i am impatient to do what must be done morel rising from his knee alarmed candida don't let him do anything rash candida confident smiling at eugene oh there is no fear he has learned to live without happiness marchbanks i no longer desire happiness life is nobler than that parson james i give you my happiness with both hands 
I love you because you have filled the heart of the woman I loved. Goodbye. He goes towards the door. Candida. One last word. He stops, but without turning to her. How old are you, Eugene? Marchbanks. As old as the world now. This morning I was eighteen. Candida going to him and standing beside him with one hand caressingly on his shoulder. Eighteen. Will you, for my sake, make a little poem out of the two sentences I am going to say to you? And will you promise to repeat it to yourself whenever you think of me? Marchbanks, without moving. Say the sentences. Candida. When I am thirty, she will be forty-five. When I am sixty, she will be seventy-five. Marchbanks, turning to her. In a hundred years, we shall be the same age. But I have a better secret than that in my heart. Let me go now. The night outside grows impatient. Candida. Goodbye. She takes his face in her hands and as he divines her intention he bends his knee she kisses his forehead then he flies out into the night she turns to morel holding out her arms to him ah james they embrace but they do not know the secret in the poet's heart end of act three end of candida by george bernard shaw